Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Anyone with us for the first time, just a special welcome. Glad you're here with us to worship. So let's uh, let the love of the brethren continue. Uh, We're currently studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. If you will turn with me, we're going to be in chapter 7 this morning, and we're going to take up verses 7 through 13. And I just want to dedicate it to all our sweet mothers, as this is the goal of all of your parenting. So uh, we'll pray for moms at the close, but I, I want you to see this is your goal. This is what you're shooting for as parents. So let's uh, read them, and then we will pray. Romans 7, beginning in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me, may it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Let's go to our God and pray. Father, I come before you, and these are beautiful, amazing words, but we need your spirit to illuminate them to our minds. God, I I don't want anyone just to walk out of here with an academic understanding of these verses. I pray that this morning your spirit would, would go into every mind and heart and that no one would walk out of here without having died to the law. God, that it did not did its purpose in every heart. I just want every moralist who's trying to be good and earn your favor, I pray today that they would die to that. I pray that the gospel would become alive, that there's a better way to be made right with God. There's a way that actually works. And I pray, let them see that. God, open eyes this morning. And I pray for the the believers in this church. God, that we would marvel again at the beauty of this gospel. And so, Lord, be with all moms, dads. God, teach us how to shepherd our children to Jesus Christ. God, let us understand your word of law and grace and and know how to practically now work this out. God, help us. We're, We're a needy people. And so we look to you to meet us and bless us in this word this morning. And it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. So we're going to preach on the law killing you for Mother's Day. I'm sorry, moms. I preached on birth control one time on Mother's Day as well, and your, your pastor has just got problems. <clears throat> Paul spent five chapters laying out the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's called the gospel of grace. And it is a gospel of what God has done to redeem people to himself, and it's altogether lovely. And now Paul, where he's going in chapter 6 and 7 is he's taking on the antagonists now who come and they're they're attacking the gospel. He knows their arguments. He's dealt with them many times. And in chapter 6, their attack is, well, if it's by grace, let's just sin then that grace might abound. And then in chapter 7, if we're not under law, what's going to restrain us? We can go live any way we want. And so the accusation is that free gospel will just cause people to sin. And the argument is that this is a salvation from sin. It's a salvation away from that. It's a salvation to God. And sin now is our great enemy. Sin is what is destroying this world. It's destroying our churches, our families, and it's destroying our own lives. Sin is the enemy. Sin. This morning, my goal is that that when we end in verse 13, Paul's going to be driving this whole argument that the law was given to make sin exceedingly sinful, that you would see it for what it is and the depth of it and how destructive it is in your very heart, that you wouldn't just go, oh, sin, academically, I just, I know about it. Paul, Paul is saying the law was given that it might get into your hearts and show you the depth of sin. 
so that no one will ever look at their hearts and their sin and go, you know what? I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix it with just a little bit of law, a little bit of effort, just some religion or, or moral cleanup. That is never going to fix what this law is going to show in your heart. It's so bad. I pray that you would see the glory of the one who came from heaven to this earth to save his people from their sins. And so to feel the weight of it so that you would go to the only remedy that could ever heal, cure, and save you from your sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. No one. I want no one left under law here this morning. That is my prayer. My prayer that everyone in this place would sit gladly and joyfully under the grace of God. And that's what I'm asking God for. I'm asking, I've been praying for Revival 2020, and I shifted it to Revival 2021. And today could be the day. What we are going to look at could begin the revival. So let's begin. I want to begin with just an illustration I came across that sat on my heart for a while. And it's from J.R. Tolkien, uh, the book he wrote, The Hobbit. And he's in, in this section, this part is with Bilbo Baggins. And he's come to the mountain where he's gone down this little passage hole and it opens up to this cavern. And in this cavern where all the jewels and treasures of the elves are contained. But in it, there lie a beast. And listen to Tolkien describe it. There he lay, a vast red golden dragon fast asleep. A thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisp of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, lay countless piles of precious things. And Bilbo stole from the shadow of the doorway across the floor to the nearest edge of the mounds of treasure above where that sleeping dragon lay, a dire menace even in his sleep. And Bilbo grasped a, a great two-handed cup, and he cast one fearful eye upwards. And Smog, which was the dragon's name, stirred a wing, opened a claw, and the rumble of his snoring changed. And then Bilbo fled from the dragon, but it, it did not awake, not yet. And so I want you to see as we begin the passage that's before us this morning, that the law is not the dragon, but sin is. Sin is the dragon in each one of our hearts, and the law comes, and you know what it does? It wakes it up. It wakes it up with a roar. It stirs it up, and it brings a rage and a fire. Paul said last week in verse 5 that, that the law came, and it aroused sin. It was the stick that po pokes the sleek, sleeping dragon, and he, he wakes up. And all of a sudden, the, the law now, sin is worse than I ever thought. I see it for what it is. That stick, that stick called law cannot save you from the dragon. The Jews thought that the law was a sword to slay the dragon of sin, to, to take it and use it to become righteous and get right with God. I'm going to use this sword to get rid of the sin in my life. And many do this on a daily basis. But the law cannot subdue sin. It, it cannot save you from sin. But it can show you how bad the dragon is that lies in your own heart. It's worse than you ever thought or dreamed. There is a self-centeredness that runs so deep that nothing can break it but the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's worse than you thought. And once you see how bad it is, it's to lead you to the doorway, which we'll call Calvary's tree, where the Prince of Glory hung and died in our place to see the one who can save you from this monster, from this dragon that will cause you to be thrown off the eternal cliff into the eternal abyss. And so the law is to lead us to Jesus Christ. And so I, I pray that that's what he would do this morning through this word. So let's take a look at Romans 7, 7 through 13. I want you to look at what Paul said. Just flip back with me to Romans 3.20. I want you to just <clears throat> Take a look at all that Paul has said about the law as we've been studying. And he tells us in, in verse 19 that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world might become accountable to God. The law is to show your sin and shut you up of bragging that you're good enough to get into his presence. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So what's the law for? For through the law comes the knowledge 
of sin. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 4.13, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world, it was not through law, but through the righteousness of faith. You'll never get there by law, but by believing the gospel. Look at Romans 5.20. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but you're under grace. 7, 4, you've been made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, so we might bear fruit. Romans 7, 6, but now you have been released from the law, having died to that by which you are bound. So here's the Jewish argument. Paul, that's dangerous stuff that you're saying. That is is dangerous. The the law is the whole Old Testament. It's it's the life of Jewish people. That that Torah has been their whole whole history, all they've known. Uh, To to quote a a theologian, his name was Bon Jovi. He said, you give love a bad name. Paul, you give law a bad name. What are you saying about law? What are you doing here? Paul's going to now defend the law. He's going to establish it. He's going to put it in the right place. The the fading glory that he had, he's going to let it shine to show you what the glory of that old covenant was. Therefore, Paul will now defend the law so that you get the right victim. You got to come out of this section getting the right perpetrator, the right problem. And the problem is not with the law. Verse 7. What shall we say then is the law of sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin. Verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law is good. The law expresses the holy will of God, his, his righteousness, what true children should live like and act like. The law is, it's the manifestation of God's righteousness. It's what God says and reveals of what he requires of his created ones. It's holy, it's righteous, and it's good. And so the law is not bad or evil. Get the right problem. So what is the problem, Paul, if it's not the law? It's you. It's you. It's not the law. It's you. And we live in a whole society and culture that works to tell you just the opposite. And you spend all your days finding a finger to point at something else of what the problem is. And the problem is always outside of you. And Paul wants you to hear this morning the problem's inside of you. Paul, by the Holy Spirit, will tell you it's your heart. And you have to have a new one. It can't be worked on. It can't be repaired. You can't get a spiritual pacemaker. You can't have a spiritual bypass. You need a new heart. And that's what we saw last week in in verse 6 is the new covenant is I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to make it new and I'm going to put that law within it. So from within now you want to obey me and please me. Is there anyone this morning willing to look away from blaming everyone else and every circumstance for why you're messed up this morning. For when the law comes, you take it. And verse 5 says it just arouses sin and you sin more. Pogo said we've met the enemy and it's me. So we have to end at the place where Paul is taking this whole argument. And in verse 13, he says he wants you to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. That's why the law uh, was given. And, and you need to use it to see the depth of your selfishness and rebellion against God. That's why he gave us a law, to be a flashlight, to shine on your heart and show you what's really in it. You, you need more than just a little religion. You need a savior from your heart and your sin and your rebellion to God. So to awaken the sin, the dragon that is within every one of us, so that I would flee to a savior. And at this point, he will become a treasure hidden in a field 
And I just know too many who sit in the church that Jesus is not, he's not much because you've never seen what's really inside your heart and why you need a savior so badly. Where I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What is before us this morning is pure gold. So I want to give you an outline of how we're going to journey through these truths this morning. Where you're going to, Paul's going to show us four uses of the law. In verse 7, the law reveals sin. And tying into last week, in verse 8, it arouses sin. And then in verses 9 through 11, the law kills us. And then in verses 12 through 13, the law shows sin's true character. And so let's look at the, the, the uses of law and what it was intended to do. And the one thing I want you to hear, it was never to be a ladder to climb to heaven and to clean yourself up and be good enough to climb that ladder. That is the one use that it was never given for. And that's the number one use of how we use it in our day and age. So let's look first. Romans 7, 7, the law reveals sin. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Is the law sin? If it's so bad, Paul, is, is the law sinful? Is there something to the law? Is it, is it sin? And his answer, the same thing as we've seen through Romans 6, may it never be. Perish the thought. Never think that way. That can't be. But on the contrary, I would have not have come to know sin except through the law. So is the law sin? No. It's, it's an aggravator of sin. It stirs it up. But what is wrong with the law is, is, is it sin, not the law. And so in verse 8, he says it's sin. In verse 9, sin became alive. Verse 11, sin taking opportunity through the law. And verse 13, rather it was sin. You just can't miss what the problem is. The problem is our sin. Sin is the problem. That is what gets the rap. It is not the law. It's our sin. And the law is the floodlight to shine on it. Much like the Spirit is the floodlight to shine on Jesus Christ in the new covenant. He shines. But the Spirit takes both. And the Spirit shines on our sin through the law and shows it. And, and he, takes, he takes the shining on our sin through the law and shining on Christ to make this beautiful marriage that we saw in verse 4. So the goal of the law is that you would get to Christ. You would die to the law and get to this marriage that's so beautiful uh, of called gospel. So the Spirit shines. Uh, he shines on the light of Christ, the radiance of His glory, who is a Savior from sin. But the power of sin is the law, so we have to die to the law. The only way out from it is Jesus Christ, not me keeping the law. You can't get out from under the law by keeping it. You got to get out by believing in the one who kept it. And that's the gospel, the whole Bible in a nutshell. So verse 7, Paul says, on the contrary, then I would not have come to know sin except through the law. And we saw in Romans 3.20 that no flesh can be justified by the law. But what Paul's writing here, it's going to go a little bit deeper, and it needs to go deeper in your heart. It's, it just can't be academic that I, I realize I can't get justified by the law. It, it, this is what he's saying is the law is going to show you what's really wrong with your heart this morning. The law shows us what the will of God is, his perfect will. And now when we sin, it's against God, against thee only have I sinned. So it's turned into transgression. I'm now violating God's will and who he is on a daily basis. So sin is rebellion to creator God. It's a big deal. And it shows that to us. And when it comes, we understand the depth of our problem and the power of it. And so the condemnation and death of its consequences become of who it is against. It's against God. It's against Almighty God. And so this is not just, man, I understand this. I get this academically. I'm a sinner. The Greek word here for knowledge, this is the idea of a, a personal experience of sin, that epinosis, that experiential knowledge of the nature and power of sin. So it can't just be an academic thing. The law is going to come, and what it has to do is it's going to go into, I get the depth of sin now. 
And our argument is, I'm the greatest of sinners. No, I'm the greatest of sinners. And when all of a sudden, it's not just some academic fact. I live in this. And it's captured me. And it's corrupted me. I was thinking of COVID-19. Anyone ever? It's just like a good illustration. Anyone heard of it? Sometimes I use illustrations and everyone's like, Pastor, I use E.F. Hutton. And you're like, who's E.F. Hutton? You heard of COVID? Even the kids should be with me. In April last year, we knew about COVID. And the reports of it were starting to come out. And we heard it in the press, medical journals, and social media. <laughs> and we started reading about this new thing, COVID-19. And you could have even maybe gone further in your knowledge. Uh, in this church, we have nurses and we have doctors. And you were dealing with patients. And you were caring for them. And you were watching the suffering and the pain and all that was going on. But there's even a closer knowledge that some of you have. You, you caught it. And the virus infected your body. And suddenly it came home, didn't it? I have COVID. And this knowledge became personal. And, and now I know COVID. And it's not a spectator knowledge any longer, but it became very personal for those who had it. And that is what the law was given to do. It's not a little formula. It's not sin is wrong, I sin, so I'm a sinner. It's bigger than that. It's epinosis. I think J.B. Phillips got it well in his translation. It says, the law brought sin home to me. We can read of Adam and Eve. We can read of the children of Israel through the Old Testament and all their sin. We can actually read of Jesus dying on the cross for my sin. But it's got to become personal. It's got to come home. And so what are you talking about, Pastor? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I've got good news for you. Paul's now going to flush that out. And he's going to give you an illustration to help you understand what that means. I've got to get this. And so look with me in verse 8. And, in, and we got... Um, for, but, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me, oh, no, I'm sorry, go back to verse seven, wrong verse. What shall we say then is the law of sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know this experiential knowledge of sin except through the law. The law is how I got acquainted with the, the depth of that lion, that dragon in my own heart. For I would not, there's a, there's a four, I'm going to explain it now. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. And this is our second point. The law arouses sin. I would have never known what coveting was if it didn't command it. Paul takes the 10th commandment from the Mosaic covenant. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You shall not covet. Romans is translated epithumia. You should not have this desire, this over-desire for something more than God. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be desiring these things. And it just goes right to the heart versus the external commands. And it deals with human desires. And the fall has done so much to ruin our desires. We saw that in Romans 1 through 3. All our desires are backwards now. We love what we should hate and we hate what we should love. We're just twisted. And this command now is dealing with the wrong directions of our desires in our heart. We desire wrong things and we desire right things for the wrong reasons. Happy Mother's Day. You can desire the, the wrong thing for your, the right thing for your children, and it can become an over-desire that's destroying you and killing you and making you crazy. And so the, our desires can go so contrary. The whole Decalogue. You shall have no other gods before me. You should desire the true God. Murder is I desire to take a life. Adultery is I desire to take a neighbor's wife. This is just such a fundamental commandment with the rich young ruler. I've kept all the laws. What do I got to do to be saved? Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. Is that how you get saved? He's going after your desires. Your desires are for riches. And I'm going to go after your heart. This is good law work right there. Until the law said you shall not covet. 
Paul said, I didn't get it. Well, what happened when this commandment came? Well, look with me in verse 8. When it came now, you shall not covet sin, taking the opportunity, that little monster, taking the opportunity, listen to what it used for its instrument, through the commandment, which is good, produced in me coveting then of every kind. The, The law exposed the sin in my heart. It spoke the prohibiting word, don't covet. It proclaimed the will of God, the God who delivered me out of slavery in Egypt. And it condemned sin and told me it was wrong. But sin, taking opportunity, it took that prohibition and it awoke my sin. And it produced in me a coveting of every sort. It it didn't do what it commanded. It didn't stop my coveting. It produced more. The law, again, it's sin's launching pad. It's its greenhouse. A friend of mine put it this way. He he gave an analogy. He said, don't covet was like a blast of fresh air on a smoldering flame. Fresh air is good. There's nothing wrong with fresh air. But it gave life to the flame and it starts a fire, a a forest fire or an inferno. Don't covet. And it just lit it to coveting of every kind. And so this is amazing. The commandment became the instrument of sin. Thou should not covet. It met with the sin in my own heart. And then I started coveting like never before. It stirred up evil desires and lusts of all kinds in my heart. Augustine, the great saint of the fourth century, he was kind of contemplating of, on, on this concept. And he said when he was young, some of his friends one night They went and stole pears from a neighbor's tree. That's what bad kids did back in that day. (laughs) If only my kids would just do that. And he later began to say, why did I do that? He says, I wasn't hungry. It's not that they were just so good. I had a pear tree right in my yard. But it was the rebellion to do a prohibition, don't eat from that tree. It just what it does. I remember when my kids were little, we were at Branson, Missouri. I love Branson. And it's raining and there's all these puddles. And I'm like, don't jump in the puddles. All three of them, all the boys, the girls skipped the puddle. But the three boys, boom, splash, got each other. I think if I would have said, just, hey, go ahead, jump in the puddles, they would have went around it. So in Romans 5.21, Paul says sin is a power. It's a power in Romans 7, 8. It's so powerful. I want you to catch this, that it can take God's holy law and use it for its own end, twist it. And Paul says in our verse, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Sin is dormant and not fully active. And earlier we saw in Romans 5 that there was still sin. There was still transgression or just sin going on in the world. But when the law came, it became transgression, revealed God's will. And now you're sinning against it. So before the law came, he says sin was dead. Sin is the problem, not the law. So how does it work? The law comes. The spirit of rebellion that's in us since the fall now, it says, don't do this. It's aroused. The self-assertiveness comes out. We resent the notion of law. We will not bow our knee to anyone. No one's going to tell me how to live my life. I'll tell what's good and bad for me. Our enmity, our spiritual rebellion is lawlessness. We hate law. We hate punishment. And we find greater sin than before the law came. So it arouses sin. I want you to look at our third point. And this is kind of the whole focus of this morning is it kills, the law kills us. So look with me in verse nine. I once was alive apart from the law. Paul's speaking here in a relative manner. There, there's a, never a time that he was without law. He was born into it. Paul always had uh, law, mosaic law. And what he is saying is there was a time when Paul thought he was faultless. Paul thought he was keeping the law. It was a legalistic righteousness. So there was a time when I thought I was doing it. He felt I was in a good standing before God. 
He was alive in the sense that he had never been put to death. He had never seen his true state before God through the law. I'm just a good guy. <laughs> I'm better than everyone else. I'm conservative. I, I'm a good person. And I, I had the same experience growing up. I, I went to church. I kept Lent. I ate tuna fish sandwiches on Friday. Who's more holy than that? <laughs> I was alive. I felt really good about myself. What a good boy am I. Philippians 3.3. 3. Paul says, we're the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, I persecuted the church. And as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. I was alive. I was alive. The, the law had not struck Paul yet. <clears throat> he was alive. Any of you alive this morning to that? It hadn't disturbed his peace yet. It, you know what it did? It helped his pride. I'm keeping it. I'm better than everyone else. I'm earning God's favor. He's so happy with me. He's self-righteous, content before God. I thank you that I'm not like other men. He didn't have the conviction of the awfulness and the depth of his sin. And so I want you to hear this as plainly as I can say it. Some churches specialize at keeping you in this place. We just want to give you a little religion and give you places to serve, uh, have some nice friends and sing some happy songs and go home. I'm telling you, that is deadly. That is deadly. You have to die to the law. It's got to kill you. And my biggest fear as a parent was always, I don't want my kids to just be good kids. I want them to see their heart and I want them to flee to Jesus Christ and be saved. And as your pastor, I don't want anyone in this church just being good and smiling and, and still content about how much better you are than everyone else. That isn't why God gave the law so you could smile and feel good about yourself. But when the commandment came, what? Paul wasn't at Sinai. The commandment's been there 14 centuries before you, Paul. What are you talking about? Though it was there, it never got him. But when it came, it got him. And it took hold of him with force and power and conviction. <clears throat> the Jews, they, they only got it by the letter. They, they, they got law. Here's the letter. But there was no enlightenment and no conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit. They just got the letter of the law. You just have it your whole life. I've lived under it. I've memorized the Ten Commandments. I went to Awana. I did backyard Bible clubs. I did all these things. But when it came, when the law came, what happened? Sin became alive. When it came upon me, it woke the dragon. It woke up and it awoke with a roar and with fire and it sprung into life. And the commandment hit sin's vital nerve and sin awoke and I revolted. And I had more coveting and rebellion than I ever thought imaginable. And oh, did I see sin. I saw it on every, I, I, my greatest burden was one thing, my sin. How do I get out of it? How do I get out from under it? It comes, and you see sin's resistance and power to the command of God. Usually when you see it, you run to law and start trying to change your life, and you find out this sin is so deep, I can't change my nature. I can't change my heart, and I, I just keep working, and nothing will change from the inside. And I started to see what a coveter I was. Coveting is because you're losing contentment in God, the fulfillment of everything. And I, God's not enough, and I got to have this, and I got to have that. And suddenly my heart just is coveting everything to make me happy because God doesn't. This command cuts across our desire path, and the commandment comes, and our wrong desires become alive. Love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I realized I love everything else more than God. I want what I want, and no one tells me what I should want. 
And then I died. I died. I died to all of my self-righteousness. I pulled in Isaiah 6, woe is me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. And everything I thought was commending me to God was manure and it was leading me away from God. Has that happened? All that I clung to that made me feel like a good boy or girl was ripped away. And my great righteousness that I couldn't wait to hand to God on that last day was suddenly manure in my hand. My little fig leaf covering was removed and I was naked before God. And I wanted to hide, but I knew I couldn't get away from his all-piercing eye. And I saw from my very nature, I didn't want to keep the law of God from my heart. I was opposed to God from the core of my being. And I saw how hopeless my sinful condition was. And you become poor in spirit. Or you're saying, I can't change this. My only hope is Jesus Christ. And look with me in verse 10. And so this commandment, which was to result in life, it's a good command the right command, it actually resulted in death for me. It it brought about just the opposite. Instead of making me righteous, it made me unrighteous. And in verse 11, sin then taking the opportunity, and again, through the commandment, it deceived me. And through it, it killed me. Why did the law do that? Well, it was sin. Sin can take a beautiful instrument like the law Obey and have life. And it tricked me and it killed me and it deceived me. And my question is, how did it deceive me? How did sin lie about the law to me and how did it trick me? Well, one way is it leads you to sin by saying, I can't keep this. I'm just going to go live any way I want. I'm going to be licentious and lawless and just go live any way I want. It tricked me. Or it can lead you to self or I'm going to be a good boy, and I'm going to work hard, I'm going to clean up, I'm going to do better. It's going to trick you. And you're going to try to just be a better person and clean up your house. It deceived you by keeping the law from tutoring you to Jesus Christ. So if, you, if the law doesn't tutor you to Christ, it, it's tricked you. It's deceived you. And so the, the way it is to work is to reveal and show you and awake that lion. And it's so powerful that nothing can remedy it but the blood of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross for my sin. The gospel is good news for sinners and for self-righteous people. If the law has deceived you, the gospel can save either this morning. The law cannot fix sin in the heart. It can just make it worse. And I want to close out with our fourth point. The law shows sin's true character. So then, verse 12, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. I just want you to see the beauty of the law this morning. It's it's holy. It's God's standard. It's righteous. It's good. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a perfect instrument. But where, what this problem was, is as weak as it was to fix your problem with sin in Romans 8, it couldn't fix it. It couldn't fix it. It cannot change a heart. It, it, it cannot. It can only shine a light on it. Don't run to law to fix it. But it can do something really, really beautiful. And if it wasn't given to fix your heart, what was it given for? Verse 13, therefore... Summary, did that which is good, the law, become a cause of death for me? May it never be. That isn't it. Rather, it was sin. Sin did it. It's, that's the culprit. That's the victim. That, that's the one killing. In order for the purpose that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. The law killed me. It showed me my sin so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. It would come and show you the depth of sin and how bad 
It really is. You could take something so good and transgress it, and you could take something so good and fool yourself and think you're keeping it. The deceptiveness of sin is so bold and bad. And my friends, that is the glory of the old covenant. The glory of the old covenant was to show you the righteousness of God and to show you that you're utterly sinful. And it was all pointing and painting and showing you that one day the Lamb of God would come into the world and he would be a savior for sin. There is no hope of human cure or relief. There is nothing but this law to tutor you to Jesus Christ where you come with nothing, a sinner, unchangeable, can't fix my condition and look to Jesus Christ. So even the, the little kids this morning, I, I pray that just being a good boy or girl isn't your goal, that you would see that the law would come and you'd begin to realize, I, I, when I don't get my way, I hate my brother or sister. I would kill him if I was old enough. And I want you to see that heart, that there's a Savior for your sin. Let's close. So I guess what I want to ask you this morning is where are you? What, what has the law done to you? And, and what I see in this world is not many people living under Mosaic law. You know, some, I, I still see it still happens and probably some here this morning. And you're under that Mosaic law and you're still trying to use it to clean yourself up. For others, it, it could just be my, my standard that I try to hold myself to. For others, it, it could be, I, I, I just, I want to be the perfect husband or wife or mom. And I just, I, I live under this standard that I just can't measure up to and I compare and I just spend all my time and I'm, I'm dying under it. I can't be the perfect mom. And so for you, that's your law and you're, you're living under it and I can't have God smile unless I'm the perfect parent and I'm as good as all the people around me and you're just living under law that way. Some, it's, I got a career and I'm going to be the best at it and I'm going to show everybody and, and you're just trying to get right. You're trying to get justification by how well you do in this life and what you accomplish and you're just sitting under law and it's just killing you. And, and the, the message is that no, no one can make themselves right with God. And we need to quit looking in all the wrong places. And we need to let it tutor us to the one who came to save sinners. And we need to look that and stare it in the face and find a savior from sin. And that is the goal of the law. So don't run to Dr. Phil or therapy or moral cleanup or the church or law. I just want you to run to Jesus Christ with what you see in your heart. Do you know how many fill our churches who are still alive to the law? And that is why we're not alive to Christ. There's just too many good people in the church who the law has not done its work and you've fled to Christ to be a savior. So, with that encouraging message, our sweet moms this is your calling. This is why I didn't back away from this text this morning. You're to teach your kids the righteous requirement of God, and you're to train them in righteousness, and you're to show them. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to show them their hearts. And so don't just, I, what, what you, we tend to do is just make a, a, a rules that they can keep, and we try to encourage them and all that. And, and what we're trying to show them is what's in their hearts. Every time they sin, I'm leading them back to their heart. Are you seeing the rebellion? Are you seeing what it's producing? And what we're trying to do is lead them to, to see that I am a sinner at the core of my being, and I need a Savior. And so I just pray, moms, never weary of law and grace, never weary of training and teaching and pointing them to Jesus Christ. Tutor them to Christ, not to Moses. Don't, don't leave them as moral little children <laughs> and feel like you succeeded. As a mom, I want to tutor them to Christ. I want them to get to him 
and believe and know and love him. And then I want you to live as a mom under grace and not law. So what my prayer is for moms, that I want you to be set free from the law. I want you to be set free from all my failures, my shortcomings, my comparison. And I just want you to be free to live under grace that you're loved and accepted by the work of Jesus Christ and not by uh, how perfect your kids are. Some of you just need to hear that. That's freedom. And then I want you to live into that freedom. And I want you to come train these little ones, not like this. If I blow it, they're going to go to hell. And you're just so uptight. And so I want you to enter in and just, man, I know Christ and I'm accepted and I'm loved. And I, I want to shepherd these little lambs to the lamb. And so I just look for that freedom and don't live under the law of condemnation and shame and, and guilt. Your, your calling is you're a, you're a daughter of God. Uh, you, you, so you have a season, you're called to be a mom, but your, your identity is you're a daughter of God. And don't ever, don't ever switch those two. And so I, I want moms to, to be set free and not live into, oh, this is my kids do this. My kids don't find your identity in that. Because those little rascals, they're gonna, sometimes they're going to look good. Sometimes they're going to look bad. Sometimes they're going to reject. Sometimes they're gonna, it's, just, it's a journey. And if my identity is in that, it, it's going to kill you. And your identity is in this God who smiles at you and is happy with you and delights over you in Christ. That's the freedom that will help you as moms to shepherd these little, these little sweet ones. So um, I want your home to smell like Mount Zion and now Mount Sinai. There's a big difference. Kids love Zion. They, they die and they rebel and they hate Sinai. And we will have a class to work through that. So model daily the glory of the new covenant in Christ and what it means to be under grace. Amen? So what, what I would like to do in closing is I would like every mom in this room, if you would just stand up, I just want you to stand up and um, we, we want to see who you are. And I just, I live in a day and age where motherhood is rejected, it's looked down upon, it's ridiculed, it's lesser. And in God's word, what a high calling. And I just, I've watched so many of you be faithful in this. And we just, as a, as a congregation, want to thank you for fulfilling this high calling. And we glory in what you're doing. So. And let me pray for these blessed mothers. Father, I pray for these ladies. God, I pray for enabling grace that you would enable them to fulfill this high calling. And God, with parenthood comes the greatest joys they'll ever taste and some of the deepest, hardest sorrows they'll ever feel. And I pray that they keep learning of a sufficient Christ to help them in every high and stormy gale. God, I thank you for these mothers and I just, I just pray, give them wisdom from above. God, teach them, lead them and guide them. And, and shepherding these children. I pray for these, these older mothers, Lord. I just pray, let them be blessed and, and enjoy the, the high calling that they would feel so much honor in how they gave their lives to serve in this way for so many years. God, bless them. Encourage their hearts for the ones who just feel discouraged this morning, God, with children who are rebelling, going different directions, Lord. Encourage their hearts. Don't let them wear that condemnation. God, we don't gloat if they're doing well, saying, look what I did, but we beat ourselves when they do bad. Set them free this morning and that they love these little lambs and did everything they knew to shepherd them. And just thank you for that, God. And so be with them, encourage their hearts this morning. I pray for all who have lost moms. Pray for those who didn't have moms. God, I pray for any any just battling under those issues of difficult relationships with moms, I pray this morning on a hard day that you meet them and you comfort them and you encourage their hearts. God, and I pray one day you wipe away every tear and just let them be blessed and encouraged in you. And so God, we thank you 
We thank you just for those of us who had moms that um, blessed us. And I just thank you for them. And I just, um, I'll never be able to thank you enough for the impact of my own mother in my life. God, I pray and I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.